new proclamations. What wise men, great men, medical men, professional people have not been able to do, God will do it. All those things that are forgotten, your forgotten strength, your forgotten power, your forgotten revelation, everything you said, I had a dream long ago. And I thought, this is what I will do. I've forgotten now, your forgotten vision will come up again. Passion will come up again. Revelation will come up again. New life will come up again in your life in Jesus' name. Only Christ Jesus has the power of this new year. An unforgettable encounter beckons. We are connecting to the God of wonders this new year for salvation and deliverance. Welcome GCK to Asaba. Delta State, Nigeria, January 26th to 31st, 2023. 1600 hours GMT daily and Global Sunday Worship at or 700 hours GMT. Also featuring ministers and professionals conference with Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Young Professionals. It's a new year of wonders this 2023. From the Niger Delta, the oil of anointing will be transported by satellite and all our social media links to over 150 countries of the world. Join the team in GCK audience as the man appointed by God, the convener of GCK, Pastor Dr. W.F. Komoi, connects the world to an unforgettable encounter with the God of Wonders. Glorious music ministrations by choirs from nations across the world with guest music ministration by Jonathan Lee. Darkness gone. Yeah. Premature death cancelled. Yeah. Yours is now to reap the benefit. GCK, the, the gospel, gospel to every creature. Let us pray. Our great God in heaven, we bless your name for bringing us here today to study your word together with other children of God. We do bless your name for all you've been teaching us in the word. And we pray that today again will be a profitable time spent at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Teach us, O Lord, and reveal more of yourself unto us. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. For in Jesus' name we pray. Today we have a Bible study from Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts, to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. These two verses we have read have a lot to say to the Christian on Christian living, as well as the foundation or the principle of Christian living and Christian conduct. All the epistles of Paul the Apostle and all the epistles of the other apostles contain doctrine and instruction on Christian living, Christian conduct, or Christian character. The early apostles and ministers of the New Testament church were raised up for the edification and maturing and the perfection of members of the body of Christ. The epistles were aimed at teaching the saints. So, Immediately the people got converted and they became brethren in Christ, saints of God. The epistles were aimed at instructing them, at teaching them, and establishing them. Not only that, those, these epistles were aimed at instructing the ignorant. There were many people that were ignorant of the basic truths of the gospel in the New Testament. And the epistles aimed at instructing them. In our midst today, there will be people, and there are people, who are ignorant of all that we need to know concerning our pilgrimage to heaven. And these studies we're having every time we come are aimed at instructing us in our areas of ignorance. Not only that, 
the pistols were aimed at correcting errors, reassuring the confused, encouraging those who are discouraged, and bringing believers to be more conformed to the image of Christ, like we heard yesterday, that the purpose of God, or the plan of God, past, present, and future, is that we'll be partakers of the divine nature, will be completely conformed to the image of Christ, and God is still working on that purpose. And the reason we have all these studies in all these epistles is that more and more, or more rapidly, that purpose of God will be achieved. If you read the epistles properly, you will see that there are no speculations on philosophical ideologies. Neither do we have explanations of fables of Jewish or Gentile origin. No place is given to anything less than the transforming gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here then, in the concluding chapters of Colossians, as is characteristic of Paul the Apostle, he gives us admonitions on Christian conduct. That's why we have titled these two verses especially on admonition to Christians. And we who are teachers and ministers of the New Testament church in this our generation should learn from this approach and teach very often, very frequently, regularly on Christian living and Christian conduct. Let me read those two verses to you again. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. If you look at these verses very closely, you will see that there is so much in these two verses. One, it talks about the Word. And you know the whole world is built on the Word. The world was framed by the Word of God or by the power of the Word of God. And the world became destroyed almost, turned upside down by the words that came out of the mouth of the serpent, the old serpent. And because Eve gave heed to those words spoken by the old serpent, you see how the world was turned upside down in a negative direction. And Eve spoke, and Adam listened. And you see the confusion and the sin that came in. But thank God, God came in again, and he spoke the word of promise that the Messiah will come. And all through the ages, you will see how God sent the prophets, and what did he, did he arm them with? The word, again. And it was that word of revelation that brought the world back to where it ought to be, through the Lord Jesus Christ, and then Christ came. The word personified the depth and the height, the breadth and the length of divine revelation came out of him. And he is the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word. And it is the Word that will shape your life. It is the Word that will recreate your life. It is the Word that will transform you completely. It says, let that Word, the Word of Christ, dwell in you richly. Now, the word Christ is very central and very important there. Many people are trying to get our attention. Enemies try to speak. But don't, don't let the words of enemies dwell in your heart. Satan is still trying to whisper to us. Don't let those words dwell in your heart. False prophets are still trying to speak. Don't let those words dwell in your heart, but the word of Christ. Not just in your head. Let it dwell in your heart richly, abundantly. Then it says all wisdom. If there's anything we need today, oh, it's the wisdom that comes from the word of Christ. And then it will lead us to teaching and admonishing, to teaching and instructing teaching and exhorting one another. It talks about the praises, talks about the psalms, talks about the hymns, and the spiritual songs, 
And then he talks of the joy that grace brings to us. We sing with that grace in our heart to the Lord. Then he talks about our deeds, our works, and the things that proceed out of us. Whatsoever ye do, wherever you are, in word or deed, maybe in the family, maybe in the church, maybe in among your friends, anywhere you are whatsoever, anytime, any day, any night, in the midst of multitudes, or maybe when you are just with a few people, whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all. Here is the principle of action for the believer. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, and the Father by him. As the Lord has said, in these two verses, we look at three points as usual. Number one, God's word in the heart. Number two, spiritual wisdom in action. Number three, the principle behind our deeds. Number one, God's word in the heart. And this is very essential. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word let, it means permit, allow. Open the door, give chance, remove all hindrances, and keep the door open so that the word of Christ will come in and settle in and have a conspicuous place in your heart and life. And it will abide there and it will dwell in you richly. All the other places, all the compartments in your heart, in your system, in your mind, in your thoughts. Where other things have been dwelling now, replace all those seeds with the word of God. And let, permit, allow, give chance to the word of Christ to dwell in you richly. This is the foundation, the cornerstone of real Christian living. We cannot know what is right until we know the word from Christ, who is the truth. Therefore, let that word, his word, dwell in you richly. You see, we'll be stumbling in darkness, except we have light from the light of the world. So then, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, to be strong enough to walk uprightly. We must feed on the word, the bread of life. So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You see, when it says, let the word, let the word, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, it's telling you that the word of God is not going to be imposed on you. The word of God is not going to be injected into you by force. Like we hold little children, we hold them tight and we give them that injection, the word of God will not enter in that way. It says, you are going to have your part to play. And you will let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You see all around us, we hear confusing, deceptive words of men so often. Think about every day. There will be people that try to advise you, that try to counsel you, that try to speak to you, that try to fill your heart with their own poisonous words. But you close the door against them. Are you listening to the word of the Lord? False prophets who speak words to no profit are ever near to lead astray. Close the door against them and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Even Satan himself is ever busy whispering his lies into our hearts and whispering his lies into the hearts of unstable souls who are unlearned and unskilled in the word of righteousness. Our strength depends on this. To let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Our security will only be realized when the word of Christ is dwelling in us abundantly, richly. Let the word, therefore, of Christ dwell in you richly. When it says in you, 
Where is that in particular? Where is the word to dwell? Yes, I'm sure you know it. It is in our hearts. In Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 6. And these words which I command this day shall be in thine heart. These words that the Lord has given unto us shall be in our heart. You see, there is something about words. Negative words sink deeper sometimes than positive words. If somebody threatens you, if somebody deceives you, if somebody slanders you, if somebody tells lies against you, if somebody injures you with words, if somebody calls you by a bad name, by the words that he uses, or if somebody curses you, sometimes because of our nature, because of the softness of the flesh, these negative words like arrows, like that, they sink deep in our hearts. And everywhere we go, that word is, is dwelling within us. They say, I will never be able to live the victorious life. They say, I will never be useful to the Lord. They say, I've made so many mistakes and sins, God will never forgive me. They say this, or they say that, the words of the Amalekites, the words of the Canaanites, the words of the giants and the Anakims, and the words of the messengers of the devil. Many times, if we're not careful, they'll be dwelling in the midst of our hearts. And they affect our own feelings. They affect our action. They affect everything about us. They even bring unbelief into us. We begin to doubt the plan of God, the promise of God, the purpose of God, because of all those other words that are dwelling within us. But God says, if you want to make the success of the Christian life, if you want to make progress in your Christian life, these words, not the words of Canaanites, these words which I command thee this day, not the words of the Anakims, not even your own words. You see your own words, the words of your flesh, the words of weakness, the words of regret, the words of looking back, the words of discouragement. Not those words, but these words of the Lord. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Brethren, let's take note of that. Let us take care of that. Whatever words we are hearing all around, let us understand it is the word of the Lord that will make us strong. It is the word of the Lord that will keep us in this narrow path that leads to heaven. It is the word of God that will establish us in the teaching and the experience of that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I'm sure, my brother, you might have read that before. My sister, you might have seen that before. But let me point something to you. If we are going to have the victory, we must allow the word of God, the word of God, to dwell within us. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Have I kept in my heart. Have I covered up in my heart that I might have the victory, that I might not sin against thee now if you keep on the words of the old boyfriend in your heart he has just written a letter uh, recently and he's uh, promising what not and he's telling you about this and about that if you don't tear that letter and burn that letter of the boyfriend if you keep that word of the old boyfriend in your heart you're going to fall back into sin and it may be the old girlfriend who the devil is sending back and is saying, go and tempt him again. Go and make him to fall again. And he is, uh, she is talking. And she is uh, trying to promise, you know, I'll be this, I'll be this, I'll be nice now. All the problems of the past, no more. And maybe she is also writing letters to you. And sending friends to talk to you so that you will go back into that sinful relationship. If you keep those words in your heart, you are going to fall. And your steps are not going to go on in the straightforward manner. But it is when you keep the word of the Lord. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Or it may be somebody has offended you. 
And you have heard about it. You have known about it. And the devil is giving you some words, words of revenge, words of retaliation. And the devil is magnifying the sin in your heart, magnifying it in your mind. If you keep all those words of, the, of offense in your heart, you are going to revenge. One day, if you are remembering it every time, keeping it in your heart, you are going to fall. But if you just brush all those aside, thy word, the word of Christ, the word of the Lord, thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Maybe recently there was a misunderstanding between you and your wife. And you see misunderstanding, words fly without control. Words go out without check. And it may be that the husband spoke some words to you, my sister, that just bothered you. Or it may be my brother, your wife, allowed some words to flow out or fly out without control. If you keep that word in your heart, you are going to remain negative. You are not going to be a happy man. And you are not going to be a good wife, my sister, if you keep those words in your heart. And you are going to sin. You are going to get angry. You are going to behave in a way that is not according to the will and the word of God. But you know the secret of victory? Thy word. Have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee? It may be you are a businessman. And some business people are bringing some deals. And they are promising this and that. And they are saying, well, your dream is going to come true. You are going to become a millionaire in a short time. And then they bring in some words. Some words of deceit. Some words of fraud. Some words that is teaching you how to do it this way, do it this way, and do it that way. If you keep those words in your heart, and you keep on meditating on them, that I'll become a millionaire in a short time. And if I just do this, do this, according to these words of fraud, then I'll become rich all of a sudden. If you keep that in your heart, you are going to sin. But if you brush them aside, and you say no, the word of Christ, the word of God, will dwell in my heart. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. That's the secret. That's the secret in Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 8. But what says he? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. Now Paul the Apostle was talking to the Romans. He said, we have preached the word. Which kind of word? The word of faith. Thank God that is a positive word, the word of Christ, that we are to keep in our heart. Not words of unbelief, not words of sin, not words of temptation, not the words that will make us think of dirty things, but words that will make us clean. The word of faith. Word of salvation, word of eternal life, keep it in your heart. And then in your mouth, it says it's not far away. It is near you. Make it as near as your heart, as near as your mouth. Because it is through that word, through that word, we'll be able to have the victory. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Verse 3, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee to know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. This is how we are to live. By every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord, does man live in our little understanding. We go to only a part of the Bible to read and to study. Some people will take all the time and study the Psalms. Because they believe that if they read the Psalms and study the Psalms, they will be getting everything that they need in life. Other people concentrate on the wisdom we get from the Proverbs. And they say if they read the Proverbs or alone, without any other part of the Word of God, wisdom in practical details of life will be theirs. Other people, on the other hand, will go into the stories and the narratives of the Old Testament. They say it contains experiences. Experiences of people who are joyful, 
people who are poor, people who are in trouble, people who are in war, people who are having victory over war, people in families, people in different, different circumstances. That if they read those narratives and stories of the Old Testament, that they know that it will give them wisdom to know how to act in this situation, that situation. Other people concentrate on the prophets. They say those prophets, they just spoke directly from the revelation from above. And human situation, human circumstances are not uh, pronounced in all those areas. It's just, just says the Lord. The word of the Lord came unto me. And this is a vision of uh, Isaiah, the son of Amos. Or this is a vision of Habakkuk. And therefore they just stay in the revelations and visions of those prophets. Other people just stay in the New Testament alone. And they stay, they stay in the Gospels. They say, I like to see Jesus go to Galilee, go to Jerusalem, go to Jericho. I like to see him answer all those questions that they ask him. And they stay only in all those places. Other people say, Jesus Christ himself has said, there are some things I should have told you, which I have not told you. When the Spirit is come, he will tell you all things. And therefore, because of that, they go to the epistles alone. Only the epistles. And they read the epistles. They study the epistles. They neglect all the other parts. Other people go to the revelation. They say, well, God, God says through Jesus Christ and through the angel that these are things that must come to pass shortly. Because of that, I'm just going to spend all my time in the revelation. But you know, God does not want us to pick and choose. That's why in the latter part of this verse 3, it said, by every word. By every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord, does man live? That's why you find my brothers and sisters, although we're studying just verses 16 and 17 of Colossians chapter 3. Then we go to the Old Testament. We come back to the New Testament. We go to the historical writings, the prophetic writings. We go to the words of wisdom, what theologians have called the words of wisdom, from Job all through to the song of Solomon. And we go back to the revelations of the New Testament. Why? Why do we do that? Why don't we just explain verses 16 and 17, all alone by themselves, without going to the other parts of the Bible? Because, because man does not live by bread alone, but by every word. Every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. Therefore, let this word dwell in your heart. Dwell in your heart richly. Dwell in your heart abundantly. Because it is by so doing that by the grace of God, you will have the victory in your life. You know, if the word of God is dwelling in you richly, whatever circumstance you are in, whatever situation you are in, there will be the appropriate word for every moment, whatever the temptation, whatever the trial, whatever the affliction, whatever the enemies are saying, whatever crossroad you find yourself, there will be a word for every season, for every moment. That's why it's very important. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Look at Job chapter 23. Job chapter 23, verse 12. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Uh, what do you understand this? My necessary food. The food that is necessary to keep my body in shape. To keep my blood moving and running and going on. To keep my muscles and bone strong. And to keep my whole personality intact and strong and, uh, and, uh, and vibrant. And this is the necessary food. But then this man says, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. The way some people, good Christians, the way they apply this is this. They say, no Bible no breakfast. They say before breakfast, I must read my Bible. I must go to the Word of God. I must read the Word of God. I know some believers listening to me who do some things that I really appreciate. Good, good believers. You see, every time they are eating, instead of just, uh, you know, talking about the words of men and hearing so and so said this about me and thinking on something that is not right, you know what they do? They put a tape recorder nearby 
and they just bring in, it may be Bible cases. Bible cases, the kind of cases we listen to at the Bible study here at the uh, Sunday, uh, Sunday fellowship that reads the Bible just directly like that. And uh, they listen to these uh, Bible recordings while they are eating. They are feeding the body, they are feeding the, they are feeding the soul, and feeding their hearts as well. Other people, what they will do is that while they are eating, some of the cases they have got from the uh, live tape, they will put a cassette on. They may not be able to listen to the whole thing all through. It may be during the time they are eating, they are able to listen to just one side. And while they, are, while they are eating, they are also listening to that message. Those people are the people that become strong. Those people are the people that actually their lives are filled with the word of God. I'm told there are some people that while they are taking their bath uh, in the morning, they will put on a Bible cassette or they will put on a message of the Bible. Those people, they do not allow, give any chance to the devil. You know, thoughts stray in, thoughts uh, come in into our hearts almost any time. But, you know, these people I'm talking about, while they are eating, they may be listening at the same time to a message. Or they may be listening to a Bible reading at the same time. While they are taking their bath. Or while they are doing, you know, some sisters, while they are walking in the kitchen. While they are cooking in the kitchen, they have the tape there and they are listening to the word of God. Those sisters, they will be strong. Those sisters will be strong. I have esteemed thy words, the words of thy mouth, more than my necessary food. If you have not started practicing these things I'm talking about, you can start. And follow the examples of these good brothers and sisters that I've spoken about. Now, what will these words do for you? In John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 63. It is the spirit that quickness. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The words that I speak unto you, those are the words of Christ. They are spirit and they are life. Therefore, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. But how can this happen? I've spoken a little about it. Let me just uh, speak a little more. How can this happen? Five things we need to know. Number one, you hear the word. Number two, you read the word. Number three, understand the word. Number four, meditate on the word. Number five, practice the word. Number one, hear the word. Luke chapter 11, verse 28. Luke 11 28. But he said, Ye rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God. Blessed are they that hear the word of God. As we come to hear in the Monday Bible study, we hear on Thursday, we hear on Sunday, blessed are they that hear the word of God. And then in your house, maybe while you are eating, you are hearing through the kisses. Or while you are taking your bath, you are hearing it through the cases. Or maybe while you are about to sleep at night, but sleep has not come. You put it in the uh, tape recorder there, and you are hearing the word. And as sleep is carrying you off, it is the word that you sleep with. Blessed are those people that hear the word of God and keep it. And keep it. Of course, that's the purpose of hearing. That we're able to keep it. Number two, read it. Hear it. When others are speaking it, hear it when the cassette is playing it, hear it when preachers are preaching it, hear it when a young person is reading it into your ears. Number two, read it for yourself too. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 16, and this epistle, and when this epistle is read among you, cause it to be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that Ye likewise read the epistle from, the, from Laodicea. We must read it. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth. Blessed is he that readeth. Let us read. Let us read the word. Read the word. Read it for yourself. Carry your Bible about. You know, in the early days of this church, in the early days of this ministry, there is a way you will know the deeper life people. And that way is that you see somebody carrying the Bible, big Bible, everywhere he goes, 
you go to him, it's likely to be of deeper life. You see someone anywhere he is, he has a New Testament in his hand. Or he has the small whole Bible in his hand. You go to him, it's likely to be of deeper life. You are in a railway station. You are in a bus stop. And you find somebody before the bus comes, he takes a little time and is reading the word of God. Go and check up, he might be from deeper life. You see, let us keep that practice. It's a wonderful practice. Hear the word. Number two, read the word. But it's not enough to just read it. Let us understand what we read. Let's look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And here are the words of Jesus Christ himself. Let us uh, see the very last sentence of that verse 15. Verse 15. The very last part of verse 15. Whoso readeth, let him understand. We must read, then we must understand what we are reading. Number four, we must meditate on the word. Meditate on the word. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Meditate. Meditate therein in the word of God day and night. And then the last part, number five, do what you are reading. Do what you are hearing. Practice what you are meditating on. Practice what you have understood in the word of God that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, then thou shalt have good success and regulate everything you do by the word of God that we will live and act by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What does this do in our lives? That gets us to point two. It gives us spiritual wisdom. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. That is what it produces. The word of God produces wisdom, spiritual wisdom. Let us see that the word of God produces wisdom actually. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom. This is your wisdom. The word of God gives us wisdom. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. For this cause also, since the day we had it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You see that? Filled with the knowledge of his will. And that knowledge produces wisdom and spiritual understanding. But then, as we talk about this wisdom, we need to understand that Christ is the wisdom of God. And only the word of Christ can make us really wise. Truly wise, completely wise. Many who seem to be wise in this world are actually foolish in the sight of God, foolish in the light of eternity. The word of God makes us wise in various ways. Number one, it makes us wise unto salvation. When you study the word, the word reveals who you are to you. A sinner by birth, by choice, by practice. When you read the word of God, the word of God shows you the impotency, powerlessness, helplessness of man. By the deeds of the Lord, no man shall be justified in his sight. When you read the word of God, the word of God points to Christ, the power of God that will make you to be free from sin. And the word of God invites you, whosoever will may come. It is the word that makes you wise unto salvation. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, 
which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Not only that, the word of God makes you wise before your adversaries and your persecutors. What made Jesus Christ to be known for his wisdom? It's the word that came out of him. When those persecutors and adversaries came, they went back and they said, no man spake like this before. Like this man. Never man spake like this. And it is the wisdom of his word. Those that came to trap him, to ensnare him, so that they'll be able to catch his word. It was the word that came out of him that made them to realize and accept that the wisdom of God was in him. Well, if we let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, it will produce wisdom before our adversaries and before our persecutors in Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, verse 15. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. Do you remember that about Stephen? The words that came out of his mouth, his enemies were not able to gainsay or resist. The word gives us wisdom before our adversaries and persecutors. Not only that, it makes us wiser than all worldly minded teachers and advisors. Many people are trying to advise us. Many people are trying to tell us, do this or do that. It is the word that makes us wiser than enemies and makes us wiser than all worldly minded teachers and advisors. Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verses 98 and 99. Thou, through thy commandments, hast made me wiser than mine enemies. For they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, all my advisors, for thy testimonies are my meditation. It makes us wise in taking decisions in all areas and details of life. This word of God we're talking about, which is to dwell richly in your heart, in every situation, even if you had been naturally ignorant. It is the word that will make you wise. Psalm 19, Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. That is, those of us who would have been naturally ignorant, not knowing where to go, what to do. It is this word that will make us really wise. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom. In all wisdom. Now, what will this wisdom produce in our lives? Read on. Teaching and admonishing one another in the Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This is what the wisdom of God does in our lives. The wisdom we're talking about is spiritual wisdom. And spiritual wisdom is practical wisdom. Making us to speak the right word at the right time to the right person. And that's what we have all been thinking about, praying about, what we desire in our lives. Because you see, many times we create enemies for ourselves by what we say. Many times we create problems for ourselves by the words that come out of our mouth. Many times we even lose some good opportunities because of the word that come out of our mouth. Many times we bring fire into our own home, into our own family, by the words that come out of our mouth, but spiritual wisdom, practical wisdom, coming out of the word of God through us will make us to speak the right word at the right time to the right person. Not only that, spiritual wisdom, which is practical wisdom, will lead us to act uprightly and righteously in every confusing and tempting situation. Think of the temptations that come across your way. It is the word of God turned into wisdom producing wisdom in your heart that will make you to know how to resist the devil, how to overcome that temptation, how to walk righteously and uprightly. Not only that, this spiritual wisdom, practical wisdom, will teach us to be calm and peaceful in the time of provocation. When the people that do not have the wisdom of God, when they provoke you, the people that are all for a fight every time you are for peace, when they try to provoke you, when they try to speak words, words from Satan, 
what from darkness, what from the world, what from demons, or what from their own flesh, or what from their own selfishness. It is the wisdom of God that will make you remain calm and peaceful in a time of provocation. This wisdom we're talking about will help you. This wisdom will help you that you'll be able to take the right road when you come to the crossroads of life. Whether we like it or not, we will come to the crossroads of life. And you will not know which way to take, but the word of God dwelling in you. And the wisdom of God that is coming out of you, it will make you to go the right road in the time you are at the crossroads of life. It will also assist you to fully represent Christ every time, everywhere, living to the glory of God. And it says, teaching and admonishing one another. The word of God will make you a counselor will make you a soul winner. The wisdom of God that comes from the word that is dwelling in you will make people to come to you. When they are fed up, they know, if I go to brother so-and-so, if I go to sister so-and-so, I'll be refreshed. He always has a word of wisdom coming out of the words of Christ that will make me just to be at rest. When people are sorrowful, they will come because they will say, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, he has the word of comfort and when people are going through afflictions terrible terrible things they would say i will go to sister so and so because i know sister so and so always has a reassuring word when i'm confused when i'm battered when i'm afflicted when there are things going on in my life that i cannot understand it a knot that is tied that i cannot lose if i go to brother so and so if i go to sister so and so he always has a reassuring word a comforting word, a word of faith that he can give unto me. You'll become a counselor. You'll become a teacher. You'll become a person that can teach and admonish other people in the right way of the Lord. You'll be admonishing and encouraging fellow pilgrims in the highway of holiness. And this word will keep you joyful. You'll be singing your way through. Because no matter, even when you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil. Because the eternal word, the word personified, Christ the living word, is with you all the time. And he tells you, never mind, we're going over. You'll be remembering the, word, the words of promise. You'll be remembering all that Jesus Christ has said. I and my father are one. No man is able to pluck you out of my hand. In the, the people that the father has given me, I lose no one. And you will you'll have the word of promise, the word of reassurance. You'll be singing your way through whatever you are going through. That's why we need the word of God. That's why we need the principle also behind every deed. That takes us to verse 17. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. This is to be the principle that makes us to act or do anything that we do. Do you know there are people in this world that have no principle in, uh, in acting? And you think about it, life without principle is like a human, a human being without brain. If somebody is living in this world, he doesn't have any brain of his own. He doesn't know when to stand up, when to sit down, when to go in a particular direction, when to talk. He'll be making a mess of every situation in life. And life without principle. It's like a human without brain. Or it's like a sheep without rudder. You see, the storms of life with the waves of the ocean will just be driving the sheep all along. And it is in for a wreck because there is no helm. There is no rudder to be able to direct it. It is like a vehicle without steering. Life without principle. It's like a vehicle without steering because, it, you know, that vehicle can carry you nowhere. The tires are good. The engine is good. The uh, petrol is there. All the other things. Are, and the, the vehicle even seems very beautiful, very good. And yet there is no steering. It can carry you nowhere. You know, a person might look handsome. A lady might look beautiful. And a person might even look, uh, you know, intelligent, naturally speaking. But he has no principle of life. Every day can hurry that comes, can sway him, can push him, can make him to go a particular direction. If somebody says, I'm not coming to church anymore, he says, well, because you are not going to church anymore, I'm not going to. He has no principle. There is no principle for his action, for his deed, for any decision that he takes. Vehicle without steering. 
It's like a house without foundation. And the storm, and the rain, and the flood will come. And without foundation, the house will collapse. The life that has no principle. It's also like the student without a teacher. They may be eager to learn, but they will never be able to learn anything, and they will never pass any test in life, any exam in life. There is no teacher. And a life without principle. How can such a life, such a one, pass the tests of life? It is like an army without captain. A captain to give the command. A captain to give the order. A captain to tell them, this is the time to arise and march on. But the army is there. All the equipments are there. They are all confused because there is no captain. And there is nobody to direct all their activities. How many people in this world are living without a good, well-tested principle to guide them. They walk on blindly and recklessly in a dark world that is full of traps and ditches. But this is a great principle we need to have to live by. Where is it? Verse 17. And whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. The same principle is um, spoken about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This same principle is spoken about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. This is a great principle of life to live by. Whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. We must always aim at the glory of God in all we think, in all we plan, in all we say, in all we decide, in all we do. A person like that cannot go wrong. A person in his home, in his office, before an enemy, before a friend, in the midst of the children of God, in the midst of the worldly people, in the market, on the road, when relaxing, when walking, every time, everything he does, everything he plans, everything he decides, everything he says, everything he even allows himself to think about, is thought about and done to the glory of God. That person cannot miss it. That person cannot sin. That person will remain in holiness of life. You see, this is the aim. We cannot aim at the exaltation of self. A person that aims at exalting himself, promoting himself, he will sin. He will talk in the wrong direction. He's going, to, he's going to commit terrible sin as he aims, his aim in everything he does is just to exalt himself. And there are not many people like that today. Even in the church, everything they do, even what they're doing for the service of God is for self-exaltation. Oh, they are sinning. Or they want to promote a particular man. They want to promote a hero. They want to promote uh, so-and-so. Well, a person like that, you will see all our conversation and actions must have the word of God at its aim. Must have the love of God in view. Must have the glory of God in view. In fact, anything less than the glory of God. As the reason for our actions, for our deeds, will make those actions and deeds sinful in the sight of the Lord. The Lord is calling upon us that whatever we do, anywhere, anytime, for any reason, the reason must be that we're seeking only, only for the glory of God. In Romans chapter 14, verses 7 and 8, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dies to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, or whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord. Every time you wake up in the morning, you just say, I am for the Lord. The life I'm living today, the things I say today, the decisions I make today, and the steps I take today, every action of my life today will be to the glory of God alone. I'm supposed to live unto God alone. If we do that, our Christian lives will be beautiful. If we do that, the principle we're living by, by will be able to withstand every storm. You can't defeat a man that is living only for the glory of God. You cannot defeat a man who does not care what happens to him. All he's looking for is the glory of God. You cannot ruin a man or a woman who 
every minute of the day, every moment of his time, is only crying, oh, the glory of God, the glory of God. He allows himself to be crushed. He allows himself to be cheated. He allows himself to be overridden. He allows himself to be pushed down. He allows himself to be hated, whatever it is, just for the glory of God. He says, if what happens to me brings glory to God, no problem. I'm only looking for the glory of God. Every word he speaks, he wastes it in the balance of the glory of God. Every decision he takes, he wastes it in the balance of the glory of God. Whatsoever ye do, therefore, do all in the name of the Lord giving thanks unto God and the Father by him. And therefore, let us make sure that this great principle is the principle we have in life, that everything we do from now on will be to the glory of God alone. I want you to rise up now on your feet, and you talk to the Lord, but that by the grace of God, everything we have learned today, you will put into practice. You will fill your heart with the word of God. In all wisdom, not only that, that wisdom will lead you to be able to, to be practical in your life. You will teach others, admonish others, comfort others, instruct others, and you will live by this principle. And whatever you do, the glory of God will be your aim. Rise up and pray. Talk to the Lord in prayer. And the Lord will definitely make his glory to be abundantly fulfilled in your life.